Section 21 of Villette by Charlotte Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Fortune. Section 21. Now, the bell had been ringing all the morning, as workmen, or servants, or coiffeurs, or tailleurs, went and came on their several errands. Moreover, there was good reason to expect it would ring all the afternoon, since about one hundred externes were yet to arrive in carriages or fiacres, nor could it be expected to rest during the evening, when parents and friends would gather thronging to the play. Under these circumstances, a ring, even a sharp ring, was a matter of course, yet this particular peal had an accent of its own, which chased my dream and startled my book from my knee. I was stooping to pick up this last, when, firm, fast, straight, right on through vestibule, along corridor, across carré, through first division, second division, grand salé, strode a step, quick, regular, intent. The closed door of the first class, my sanctuary, offered no obstacle. It burst open, and a palatot and a bonnet grec filled the void. Also, two eyes first vaguely struck upon, and then hungrily dived into me. C'est celle-là, said a voice. Je la connais. C'est l'anglais. Tant pis, two anglais. Eh, pas consequent. To begule, quel soit, elle fera mon affaire. Où je serai, pourquoi? Then, with a certain stern politeness, I suppose he thought I had not caught the drift of his previous uncivil mutterings, and in a jargon the most execrable that ever was heard, Miss, play you must, I am planted there. What can I do for you, Monsieur Paul Emmanuel? I inquired, for Monsieur Paul Emmanuel it was, and in a state of no little excitement. Play you must, I will not have you shrink, or frown, or make the prude. I read your skull that night you came. I see your moyens. Play you can. Play you must. But how, Monsieur Paul, what do you mean? There is no time to be lost, he went on, now speaking in French. And let us thrust to the wall all reluctance, all excuses, all menorderies. You must take a part. In the vaudeville? In the vaudeville, you have said it. I gasped. Horror struck. What did the little man mean? Listen, he said. The case shall be stated, and you shall then answer me yes or no, and according to your answer shall I ever after estimate you. The scarce suppressed impetus of a most irritable nature glowed in his cheek, fed with sharp shafts his glances, a nature, the injudicious, the mawkish, the hesitating, the sullen, the affected, above all, the unyielding, might quickly render violent and implacable. Silence and attention was the best balm to apply. I listened. The whole matter is going to fail, he began. Louise van der Kelkhoff has fallen ill, at least so her ridiculous mother asserts. For my part, I feel sure she might play if she would. It is only good will that lacks. She was charged with a role, as you know or do not know, it is equal. Without that role, the play is stopped. There are now but a few hours in which to learn it. Not a girl in this school would hear reason and accept the task. Forsooth, it is not an interesting, not an amiable part. Their vile amour propre, that base quality of which women have so much, would revolt from it. English women are either the best or the worst of their sex. Dieu sait que je les déteste comme la peste ordinairement. This between his recreant teeth. I apply to an English woman to rescue me. What is her answer? Yes or no? A thousand objections rushed into my mind. The foreign language, the limited time, the public display. 
Inclination recoiled. Ability faltered. Self-respect, that vile quality, trembled. No, 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 said all these. But looking up at Monsieur Paul, and seeing in his vexed, fiery and searching eye, a sort of appeal behind all its menace. My lips dropped the word, we. Oui. For a moment, his rigid countenance relaxed, with a quiver of content. Quickly bent up again, however, he went on, Vite à l'ouvrage. Here is the book. Here is your roll. Read. And I read. He did not commend. At some passages he scowled and stamped. He gave me a lesson. I diligently imitated. It was a disagreeable part, a man's, an empty-headed fop's. One could put into it neither heart nor soul. I hated it. The play, a mere trifle, ran chiefly on the efforts of a brace of rivals to gain the hand of a fair coquette. One lover was called the Ours, a good and gallant but unpolished man, a sort of diamond in the rough. The other was a butterfly, a talker and a traitor, and I was to be the butterfly, talker and traitor. I did my best, which was bad, I know. It provoked Monsieur Paul. He fumed. Putting both hands to the work, I endeavoured to do better than my best. I presume he gave me credit for good intentions. He professed to be partially content. Ka-ira! He cried, and as voices began sounding from the garden and white dresses fluttering among the trees, he added, You must withdraw. You must be alone to learn this. Come with me. Without being allowed time or power to deliberate, I found myself in the same breath, convoyed along as in a species of whirlwind. Upstairs, up two pair of stairs, nay, actually up three, for this fiery little man seemed as by instinct to know his way everywhere. To the solitary and lofty attic was I born, put in and locked in, the key being in the door, and that key he took with him, and vanished. The attic was no pleasant place. I believe he did not know how unpleasant it was, or he would never have locked me in with so little ceremony. In this summer weather, it was hot as Africa, as in winter, it was always cold as Greenland. Boxes and lumber filled it, old dresses draped its unstained wall, cobwebs its unswept ceiling. Well was it known to be tenanted by rats, by black beetles, and by cockroaches. Nay, rumour affirmed that the ghostly nun of the garden had once been seen here. A partial darkness obscured one end, across which, as for deeper mystery, an old russet curtain was drawn, by way of screen to a sombre band of winter cloaks, pendant each from its pin, like a malefactor from his gibbet. From amongst these cloaks, and behind that curtain, the nun was said to issue. I did not believe this, nor was I troubled by apprehension thereof, but I saw a very dark and large rat, with a long tail, come gliding out from that squalid alcove, and moreover my eye fell on many a black beetle dotting the floor. These objects discomposed me more, perhaps, than it would be wise to say, as also did the dust, lumber, and stifling heat of the place. The last inconvenience would soon have become intolerable, had I not found means to open and prop up the skylight, thus admitting some freshness. Underneath this aperture I pushed a large empty chest, and having mounted upon it a smaller box, and wiped from both the dust, I gathered my dress, my best, the reader must remember, and therefore a legitimate object of care, fastidiously around me, ascended the species of extempore throne, and being seated, commenced the acquisition of my task, while I learned, not forgetting to keep a sharp lookout, on the black beetles and cockroaches, of which more even I believe than of the rats, I sat in mortal dread. 
My impression at first was that I had undertaken what it really was impossible to perform, and I simply resolved to do my best and be resigned to fail. I soon found, however, that one part in so short a piece was not more than memory could master at a few hours' notice. I learned and learned on, first in a whisper and then aloud, Perfectly secure from human audience, I acted my part before the garret vermin, entering into its emptiness, frivolity and falsehood, with a spirit inspired by scorn and impatience, I took my revenge on this fat, by making him as fortuitous as I possibly could. In this exercise the afternoon passed. Day began to glide into evening, and I, who had eaten nothing since breakfast, grew excessively hungry. Now I thought of the collation, which doubtless they were just then devouring in the garden far below. I had seen in the vestibule a basketful of small pâté à la crème, than which nothing in the whole range of cookery seemed to me better. A pâté, or a square of cake, it seemed to me would come very apropos, and as my relish for those dainties increased, it began to appear somewhat hard that I should pass my holiday fasting and in prison. Remote as was the attic from the street door and vestibule, yet the ever-tinkling bell was faintly audible here, and also the ceaseless roll of wheels on the tormented pavement. I knew that the house and garden were thronged, and that all was gay and glad below. Here it began to grow dusk, the beetles were fading from my sight. I trembled lest they should steal on me a march, mount my throne unseen, and unsuspected invade my skirts. Impatient and apprehensive, I recommenced the rehearsal of my part merely to kill time. Just as I was concluding, the long-delayed rattle of the key in the lock came to my ear. No unwelcome sound. Monsieur Paul, I could just see through the dusk that it was Monsieur Paul, for light enough still lingered to show the velvet blackness of his close-shorn head and the sallow ivory of his brow, looked in. Brava! cried he, holding the door open and remaining at the threshold. J'ai tout entendu, c'est assez bien, encore! A moment I hesitated. Encore! said he sternly. Et point de grimace, à bas la timidité. Again I went through the part, but not half so well as I had spoken it alone. Enfin, elle said, said he, half dissatisfied, and one cannot be fastidious or exacting under the circumstances. Then he added, you may yet have twenty minutes for preparation. Au revoir, and he was going. Monsieur, I called out, taking courage. Eh bien, que c'est que c'est, mademoiselle? J'ai bien faim. Comment, vous avez faim, et la collation? I know nothing about it. I have not seen it, shut up here. Ah, c'est vrai, cried he. In a moment, my throne was abdicated, the attic evacuated, an inverse repetition of the impetus which had brought me up into the attic instantly took me down, 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 to the very kitchen. I thought I should have gone to the cellar. The cook was imperatively ordered to produce food, and I, as imperatively, was commanded to eat. To my great joy, this food was limited to coffee and cake. I had feared wine and sweets, which I did not like. How he guessed that I should like a petit pâté à la crème, I cannot tell, but he went out and procured me one from some quarter. With considerable willingness, I ate and drank, keeping the petit pâté till the last as a bon bouche. Monsieur Paul superintended my repast and almost forced upon me more than I could swallow. A la bon heure, he cried, when I signified that I really could take no more, and with uplifted hands, implored to be spared the additional roll on which he had just spread butter. You will set me down as the species of tyrant and bluebeard, starving woman in a garret. 
whereas, after all, I am no such thing. Now, mademoiselle, do you feel courage and strength to appear? I said I thought I did, though, in truth, I was perfectly confused, and could hardly tell how I felt, but this little man was of the order of beings who must not be opposed, unless you possessed an all-dominant force sufficient to crush him at once. Come then, said he, offering his hand. I gave him mine, and he set off with a rapid walk, which obliged me to run at his side in order to keep pace. In the carré he stopped a moment. It was lit with large lamps. The wide doors of the classes were open, and so were the equally wide garden doors, orange trees in tubs, and tall flowers in pots, ornamented these portals on each side. Groups of ladies and gentlemen in evening dress stood and walked amongst the flowers. Within, the long vista of the schoolrooms presented a thronging, undulating, murmuring, waving, streaming multitude, all rose and blue and half-translucent white. There were lustres burning overhead. Far off there was a stage, a solemn green curtain, a row of footlights. Ne sais pas que c'est beau? demanded my companion. I should have said it was, but my heart got up into my throat. Monsieur Paul discovered this and gave me a side skull and a little shake for my pains. I will do my best, but I wish it was over, said I. Then I asked, are we to walk through that crowd? By no means. I manage matters better. We pass through the garden. Here. In an instant we were out of doors. The cool, calm night revived me somewhat. It was moonless, but the reflex from the many glowing windows lit the court brightly, and even the alleys, dimly. Heaven was cloudless, and grand with the quiver of its living fires. How soft are the nights of the continent! How bland, balmy, safe! No sea fog, no chilling damp. Mistless as noon, and fresh as morning. Having crossed court and garden, we reached the glass door of the first class. It stood open, like all other doors that night. We passed, and then I was ushered into a small cabinet, dividing the first class from the Grand Salet. This cabinet dazzled me. It was so full of light. It deafened me. It was clamorous with voices. It stifled me. It was so hot, choking, thronged. De l'ordre, du silence, cried Monsieur Paul. Is this chaos? he demanded. And there was a hush. With a dozen words and as many gestures, he turned out half the persons present and obliged the remnant to fall into rank. Those left were all in costume. They were the performers, and this was the green room. Monsieur Paul introduced me. All stared, and some tittered. It was a surprise. They had not expected the Englishwoman would play in a vaudeville. Ginevra Fanshawe, beautifully dressed for her part, and looking fascinatingly pretty, turned on me a pair of eyes as round as beads. In the highest spirit, unperturbed by fear or bashfulness, delighted indeed at the thought of shining off before hundreds, my entrance seemed to transfix her with amazement in the midst of her joy. She would have exclaimed, but Monsieur Paul held her and all the rest in check. Having surveyed and criticised the whole troop, he turned to me. You too must be dressed for your part. Dressed, dressed like a man, exclaimed Zélie St. Pierre, darting forwards, adding with officiousness, I will dress her myself. To be dressed like a man did not please and would not suit me. I had consented to take a man's name and part as to his dress. Halt la no. I would keep my own dress. Come what might, Monsieur Paul might storm, might rage. I would keep my own dress. I said so with a voice as resolute in intent as it was low and perhaps unsteady in utterance. He did not immediately storm or rage, as I fully thought he would. 
he stood silent. But Zili again interposed. She will make a capital petit maitre. Here are the garments, all, all complete, somewhat too large, but I will arrange all that. Come, cher ami, belle anglaise. And she sneered, for I was not belle. She seized my hand. She was drawing me away. Monsieur Paul stood impassable, neutral. You must not resist, pursued Saint-Pierre, for resist I did. You will spoil all, destroy the mirth of the peace, the enjoyment of the company, sacrifice everything to your amour propre. This would be too bad. Monsieur will never permit this. She sought his eye. I watched, likewise, for a glance. He gave her one, and then he gave me one. Stop, he said slowly, arresting St. Pierre who continued her efforts to drag me after her. Everybody awaited the decision. He was not angry, not irritated. I perceived that, and took heart. You do not like these clothes? he asked, pointing to the masculine vestments. I don't object to some of them, but I won't have them all. How must it be then? How accept a man's part? and go on the stage dressed as a woman. This is an amateur affair, it is true, a vaudeville de pensionat. Certain modifications I might sanction, yet something you must have to announce you as of the nobler sex. And I will, monsieur, but it must be arranged in my own way. Nobody must meddle. The things must not be forced upon me. Just let me dress myself. Monsieur, without another word, took the costume from Saint-Pierre, gave it to me, and permitted me to pass into the dressing-room. Once alone, I grew calm and collectedly went to work. Retaining my woman's garb without the slightest retrenchment, I merely assumed, in addition, a little vest, a collar, and cravat, and a paletot of small dimensions, the whole being the costume of a brother of one of the pupils, Having loosened my hair out of its braids, made up the long back hair close, and brushed the front hair to one side, I took my hat and gloves in my hand, and came out. Monsieur Paul was waiting, and so were the others. He looked at me. That may pass in a pensionnat, he pronounced, then added not unkindly, Courage, mon ami, un peu de sang froid. Un peu d'aplomb, Monsieur Lucien, et tout ira bien. Saint Pierre sneered again in her cold, snaky manner. I was irritable because excited, and I could not help turning upon her and saying that if she were not a lady and I a gentleman, I should feel disposed to call her out. After the play, after the play, said Monsieur Paul. I will then divide my pair of pistols between you and we will settle the dispute according to form. It will only be the old quarrel of France and England. But now the moment approached for the performance to commence. Monsieur Paul, setting us before him, arranged us briefly, like a general addressing soldiers about to charge. I don't know what he said, except that he recommended each to penetrate herself with a sense of her personal insignificance. God knows... I thought this advice superfluous for some of us. A bell tinkled. I and two more were ushered on to the stage. The bell tinkled again. I had to speak the very first words. Do not look at the crowd, nor think of it, whispered Monsieur Paul in my ear. Imagine yourself in the garret, acting to the rats. He vanished. The curtain drew up, shriveled to the ceiling. The bright lights, the long room, the gay throng burst upon us. I thought of the black beetles, the old boxes, the worm-eaten bureau. I said my say badly, but I said it. That first speech was the difficulty. It revealed to me this fact, that it was not the crowd I feared so much as my own voice. Foreigners and strangers, the crowd were nothing to me, nor did I think of them. When my tongue once got free, 
and my voice took its true pitch and found its natural tone, I thought of nothing but the personage I represented and of Monsieur Paul, who was listening, watching, prompting in the side scenes. By and by, feeling the right power come, the spring demanded gush and rise inwardly, I became sufficiently composed to notice my fellow actors. Some of them played very well, especially Geneva Fanshawe, who had to coquet between two suitors and managed admirably. In fact, she was in her element. I observed that she once or twice threw a certain marked fondness and pointed partiality into her manner towards me, the fop. With such emphasis and animation did she favour me, such glances did she dart out into the listening and applauding crowd, that to me, who knew her, it presently became evident she was acting at someone, and I followed her eye, her smile, her gesture, and ere long discovered that she had at least singled out a handsome and distinguished aim for her shafts, full in the path of those arrows, taller than other spectators, and therefore more sure to receive them, stood in attitude quiet but intent, a well-known form, that of Dr. John. The spectacle seemed somehow suggestive. There was language in Dr. John's look, though I cannot tell what he said. It animated me. I drew out of it a history. I put my idea into the part I performed. I threw it into my wooing of Ginevra. In the hours, or sincere lover, I saw Dr. John. Did I pity him, as erst? No, I hardened my heart, rivalled and outrivalled him. I knew myself but a fop, but where he was outcast, I could please. Now I know I acted as if wishful and resolute to win and conquer. Ginevra seconded me. Between us, we half changed the nature of the role, gilding it from top to toe. Between the acts, Monsieur Paul told us he knew not what possessed us, and half expostulated, C'est peu être plus beau que votre modèle, said he. Mais c'est non pas juste. I know not what possessed me either, but somehow my longing was to eclipse the ours, i.e. Dr. John. Ginevra was tender. How could I be otherwise than chivalric? Retaining the letter, I recklessly altered the spirit of the role. Without heart, without interest, I could not play it at all. It must be played. In went the yearned-for seasoning. Thus favoured, I played it with relish. End of section 21. Recording by Leanne Fortune.